was little, I went to Catholic school. My family wasn't religious, but where I came from, Catholic education tended to be better than the public system. So off I went, clad in a blue checkered uniform, a school bag that I could fit inside, and Mary Janes that were three sizes too big for me. Growing up, I loved my time at Catholic school. I had amazing teachers, I was good friends with my classmates, and the uniforms actually weren't that bad. But looking back on it, I probably could have used a, a lesson in Bible 101 before I was shoved into the deep end of religion. Most of the other kids in my grade came from pretty hardcore religious families, the ones that went to church every Sunday and went to midnight mass on Christmas. My sole source of biblical knowledge, however, was watching VeggieTales once at a friend's house. This lack of theological knowledge became greatly apparent in my first years of schooling and set the stage for some of my earliest childhood memories. See, I wasn't a bad kid, not intentionally anyway, just a little clueless at times. So, when a girl in my year one classroom challenged me to put my middle finger up in the air, I did it. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it, I just thought it was one of those physical limitations, like not being able to lick your elbow or touch your tongue to your nose. Of course, with my form teacher, with my luck, my form teacher came in half a second later, just as I was saying, see, I can do it, it's not that hard, to me flipping the bird in the middle of a classroom of six-year-olds. <laughs> Obviously, my teacher then pulled me aside and lectured me on why what I did was wrong. See, this particular teacher was very sweet and very religious. So of course, she told me what any other sane adult would, that putting up my middle finger was an insult to God and that if I did it again, I was gonna burn in hell as you do. What I don't think she understood, however, was that to me, the Bible was just another story. It wasn't really presented to me as something really important. Even at six years old, I was smart enough not to say that out loud, so I smiled and I nodded and I went back to being the cold-blooded little criminal I was. The very next year, I moved schools. The school I moved to had the best results in the country for SEA schools. The SEA a exam is sort of like the SATs for 12 year olds. Of course, being the little smart aleck that I was, I sat the exam when I was 11. Being that young, I had to work twice as hard as anyone else in my class. When my mother was at school, she was at the top of her class in every subject and that meant I needed to live up to her impressively high standards. This was all well and good, but things hit a snag when at the age of seven I still couldn't recite my 12 times tables. My mother woke me up at 4 a.m. every morning for a week and went over my 12 times tables for hours until it was time to go to school. At the end of those few weeks, I was so humiliated and exhausted that I cried until I couldn't form words anymore. But I remembered my 12 times tables. At school, I had an excellent track record. At this point in time, I was getting up by four o'clock in the morning, every single morning, like clockwork, to memorize, recite, and repeat until it was time to go to school. Three months later, I had six full-length essays memorized word for word. I got full marks in every single one of those essays and I hadn't written a single word of them. When it was finally time for me to take the SEA exams, I was relieved. All my hard work could finally end after that moment. I could finally relax. I got into my first choice school, the school that my mother attended. After my first day at St. Joseph's Convent had ended, I regretted being so good at memorizing things. But there was a new opportunity on the horizon for me. My father, at the ripe old age of 60, decided that he wanted to go back home to live out his retirement. At the age of 12, I don't think I'd ever been so relieved to be leaving home. On November 12th, 2016, we arrived in New Zealand. It wasn't my first time here, but this time it was different. This time I was here to stay. During my first year in New Zealand, I was pretty reserved. I didn't want to cause trouble. So, I went to school and I enjoyed learning for the first time in 11 years. However, after a year in New Zealand, I started to get comfortable. So comfortable, in fact, I decided to try something completely new. Model United Nations. <laughs> I never knew that you could have so much fun arguing about bombs. During my first Model UN event, I was understandably nervous. I didn't really know anyone there. And then I met someone who had completely changed the course of my life. For anonymity's sake, let's call him Joe. Joe was sweet. He showed me around, introduced me to his friends, 
and showed me how to structure an argument. It was the very first time that someone had shown a genuine interest in me. A couple of weeks went by until we were at the point where we were Skyping every night and texting all hours of the day. For the first time, I felt like I was special. Joe made me laugh. He held me through my first panic attack. He listened to me when I said that some days I was so anxious that I hit my head against a wall. I thought he was the best friend I could have ever asked for. I relied on him for so much, for comfort, for validation. Because of this, I ignored some of his more questionable habits. How people would tell me to be careful with him. How people moved away when he walked into a room. How sometimes he'd leave me weird messages late at night. A couple of weeks later, after my dad had driven him home, he said that he would like it if I stopped meeting up with Joe. That he got a weird vibe from him. I ignored that too. I had fought so hard to be independent and I refused to let my dad take that from me. I thought my dad was trying to control me, to make things go back to the way they were in Trinidad. So I ignored him. I met up with Joe in secret. I was in year nine, He's, he was in year 12. I still can't get away from the memories of what he did to me. After I finally cut him out of my life, I was relieved. And I told everyone that I was okay, that I was mature enough to handle it. At 13 years old, I don't think I understood that no one is mature enough to handle that. I was very determined that adults would remain unaware of my situation. Then my school found out and that secrecy plan went completely out the window. My principal sat me down and helped me tell my dad. I thought he'd be angry, but he wasn't. He was scared just as scared as I was. A good three months after the incident, I went to therapy. I also went on medication, and it helped. It helped a whole lot better than I thought it would. I wasn't necessarily happy, but I was okay. I started talking to my dad more, and with the help of my therapist, I realized that I was allowed to feel things just as much as everyone else was. Sometimes, it's still hard for me to grasp that idea. About six months after my first therapy appointment, my health insurance sent me to a doctor for a psychiatric assessment. That psychiatrist diagnosed me with high-functioning autism and Tourette's. After that, things started to make a lot more sense for me. I started to understand why I was always on edge, why I could never seem to grasp why people reacted the way they did and why I reacted differently than they did. I started to cope. I started wearing headphones more, and it helped. Late, they blocked out all the other noise and gave me a fighting chance at living in an environment that everyone else flourished in so easily. After about a week of peace, the dean of my school told me I would have to stop wearing headphones in, during class. So I did. And without my headphones blocking out all the other sound, things got worse. About three years ago, I met Mrs. Mary Wood. Mrs. Wood was my year nine dean, and later on, my year 10 humanities teacher. Mrs. Wood does terrify me sometimes, but she's a really interesting woman, and I honestly respect her for everything she does for her students. But there's one thing she said that always sticks with me. Mrs. Wood was always the one I would tell when things happened, because she seemed genuinely interested in what I had to say. On one particular occasion, she stopped me after my first sentence. She said, slow down. Not everyone moves as fast as you do, and your ideas need to be heard and understood by other people. So of course, like the good little soldier that I was, I slowed down my speech and thought a bit more about what I was going to say and tried again. Even now, as in three times during the course of this speech, I still catch myself and think, would Mrs. Wood chew me out for spe speaking this fast? Because if the answer is yes, I need to stop. <laughs> Her words reminded me that everyone is different and that sometimes accommodations need to be made so that they can understand. A week later, I started wearing my headphones at school again. This time, after a doctor's note and a glorified speech on why I needed to wear headphones 
and why I was going to wear headphones, even if that made other people look at me funny. At first, I felt kind of selfish. Who was I to demand that I wore headphones and no one else got to? And that's when I realized that sometimes you've just got to be selfish. We often use the word selfish as something to describe someone evil, wicked, only out for their own gain. But here's the thing. Selfish is not inherently bad. I know, officers, arrest, arrest her. She's right here. Ring the alarm bells, arrest her, I swear to God. But the more I think about it, the more I start to question exactly what's so wrong with knowing your boundaries and standing behind them with all the confidence that you are a person who deserves to be respected. Because if we all did that, then we'd all be respected. So I'm what, like, I'm what I'd like to describe as positively selfish. I'm selfish, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because sometimes you've just got to draw your line in the sand, stand behind it, and scream to whoever will listen that you are a human being and you matter just as much as everyone else does. My name is Sasha Gunn. I'm 15 years old. I'm autistic and I hate loud noises. I also love hugs. I watch cartoons when I'm sad. I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm kind, I would die for my friends, and I deserve to be respected. My name is Sasha Gunn, and I'm selfish. <laughs>